We will do, we'll cover two topics during this session. The one is on the sun gas production, and the second one is the historical developments in fissure drop synthesis. Our first speaker on the second session this morning is Dr. Jens Rostock Nielsen. And uh, Dr. Nielsen is director of R&D and member of the executive board of Harder Topso in Denmark. He got his training at Denmark's Technical University, an MSc in chemical engineering in 1963, and a doctor degree in 1976, uh, with the topic steam reforming catalysts. He has worked many years in the development of Nielsen gas technologies, and has been president of the Danish Academy of Technical Sciences, and has served as chairman of the Danish Research Policy Council. The, the title of Dr. Rostock Nielsen's presentation is, uh, is Sun Gas Generation. Dr. Rostock uh, Nielsen. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk about the expensive path of the uh, overall conversion of gas to liquids. Uh, it may be the, more, the most uh, expensive, but of course the synthesis is the most important one. The title uh, of my presentation is uh, Sin Gas in Perspective. I would like to start to follow up with a Mark Rice presentation with a historical review of syngas and then talk about uh, syngas technology for fissure trap synthesis and uh, also thermal reforming and uh, if I get time for it uh, I will also discuss briefly alternative routes um, but the conclusion is that it's doable today, it's economic today but also thermal reforming. Now talking about fissure trap synthesis in Actually, uh, one of the first uh, groups studying the steam reforming and CO2 reforming was uh, fission traps themselves in the late uh, 20s. They published a paper uh, on uh, the conversion of methane by means of steam or CO2. And uh, already at that time, they found out that there is no mystery in CO2 reforming, which of course uh, you should uh, believe was different. Uh, if you read the literature today. So you have these uh, uh, two reactions uh, going on. The first uh, uh, industrial steam reforming plants uh, on natural gas were built uh, in uh, around 1930 at Baton Rouge by Exxon. It was based on uh, a very loose formulated patent uh, by Vitash in 1912, and uh, maybe the Germans are not pretty sure already practiced it, maybe with coke gas, not with natural gas at least, uh, in the mid 20s. Then the development uh, 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 went fast, and not the least after the war when plenty of natural gas was to be used for the chemical industry, and not only uh, the, the natural gas in Europe, uh, we were referred to NAFTA. And uh, the next breakthrough in the technology was pioneered by ICI, uh, our dear competitor, and uh, they were able to introduce the use of NAFTA uh, as feedstock as well as uh, increasing the pressure. And thereby, uh, the um, uh, steam reforming technology became extremely competitive and uh, was thereafter almost the only technology used for manufacture of uh, syngas. The steam reforming of uh, higher uh, hydrocarbons of NAFTA, you could say, is a reverse fischer trotz reaction. Uh, the mechanism without using that to design a catalyst uh, is uh, relatively simple because uh, the higher hydrocarbons are cut into C1 spaces, uh, like in a sausage machine and they react then to, uh, to CO and hydrogen and then you have it accompanied with a water shift gas reaction. If the temperature is too high, uh, you uh, will get uh, steam cracking, olefins and coke, but you can also have that these spaces will form carbon. Uh, the developments of uh, uh, ICI and at almost the same time for low temperature British Gas Council 
was followed up also by Chopso, and also in the mid 60s we introduced our process uh, with uh, 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 with NAFTA. We uh, used another catalytic principle, meaning that we had much higher catalytic activity present, and it means that if the feedstock is desulfurized, we can steam reform it. Recently, we demonstrated that on Sasso Fischer Traps diesel, uh, that uh, we could uh, achieve complete conversion into equilib equilibrium gas uh, over a wide range of uh, temperatures. You can see uh, the conversion, which is equal to the equilibrium conversion, and also the methane slick. Uh, the way you would do this in practice would be to have a low temperature reforming, so-called pre-reformer, and the exit gas could then be further reformed to hydrogen, or you could put it into a high temperature fuel cell, if that is what you want. So the fischer trucks uh, diesel could be converted back into syngas. This uh, uh, is almost the same thing as uh, Mark Rye said, that you really have uh, a syngas cycle. Uh, you make the syngas either by gasification, uh, the Texas Coast Shell technology, uh, the, or the thermal reforming or steam reforming, and the syngas, of course, you can further convert it into hydrogen, you can make methanol, bimethyl ether, you could convert the uh, methanol bimethyl ether into gasoline, we, or you could do it directly as we did with the tire gas process. I have it here, we made that in the, in the early 80s, here you see uh, the Danish minister getting the synthetic gasoline on this car. Uh, this guy who was responsible for the pilot plant is laughing. Uh, but uh, the car was able to drive. This is the driver. He is not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> if um, in, um, uh, during the energy crisis uh, in the 70s, also you were interested in going back to methane, uh, uh, by the so-called methanation reaction to make substitute natural gas because, uh, uh, not because of lack of methane, but because uh, uh, people were, were afraid that, uh, that uh, uh, natural gas would not be available uh, uh, because of the disturbance, political disturbances. However, that was all closed down when Reagan became president within a, a week or two. All people who were to attend a meeting on a project uh, they could simply not find the office, the office had been closed and he was already dispersed. So that means that everything uh, may be uh, reinvented because uh, who will like to read old reports, uh, you have to reinvent uh, the conversion of syngas into methane if that will be actual uh, again and coal gasification the few also. So things are going around. I myself have worked uh, on the steam reforming, also on the tire gas, and also on the methanation. I've always been busy, but I, uh, someplace in the soil. If we uh, uh, look at the alternative route, then we have uh, uh, the oxygen blown uh, syngas technologies. In fact, uh, that was uh, also referred to uh, already by this patent by Mitchell and Schneider in 1912 because they, they happened to write that uh, you could have internal heating. And uh, that has been apparently sufficient to say that that was already patent at that time. It's an interesting piece of literature to read. There's nothing precise in, in uh, that patent. But nevertheless, Exxon paid Barnish a license uh, in order to use it at first. You have uh, in uh, principle, three different routes for converting uh, methane into syngas by partial oxidation. You have uh, the non catalytic routes, they were mentioned already. They result in a hydrogen CO ratio uh, too low for normal fischer trough synthesis, and you also have difficulties in, an avo in avoiding soup formation. You could have the direct catalytic partial oxidation, I shall come back to that, but as a, an intermediate or hybrid process, you could use uh, the thermal reforming, and that is uh, combining uh, the advantages of the uh, non catalytic com partial combustion uh, with uh, CPO. You have uh, uh, 
uh, oxygen or enriched air or air, but uh, for this purpose, oxygen and the natural gas, and they are mixed uh, in a proprietary burner, and this mixing thing is the key issue. And then you have a combustion to CO and, and water. Of course, things in this flame zone uh, are very complex. And then uh, this hot gas would hit the, the catalyst gate where you equilibrate the reforming and the shift reaction. So uh, what comes out here is a simple thermodynamic calculation uh, when knowing temperature, pressure, and composition here, you can calculate the equilibrated uh, gas and exit uh, temperature. This process uh, was uh, pioneered uh, in the 30s by a Belgian uh, company, Suji Peji Dasut, SBA, and uh, in the mid 50s, uh, John D. Topso, and uh, from the 70s or 80s, uh, uh, by Topso alone. The first reactor uh, went on stream uh, in 62, uh, see a photo of that, um, and uh, then the developments have uh, uh, continued. Uh, the main uh, step has been to uh, reduce uh, the steam to carbon ratio. Uh, the original plants were built with steam to carbon ratios around two, and then we modified that by a quick test in uh, an industrial unit to 1.3. And uh, then uh, we could not decrease the steam carbon ratios further in, uh, in uh, industrial plants uh, without making uh, strange things. So uh, we, uh, we uh, established a pilot unit. And the first industrial demonstration of that uh, is only a year old and uh, that is today our design basis. Now, uh, I would briefly tell a little bit uh, about uh, how we have worked on these developments and uh, the main strategy has always been uh, to get away from bench scale units. You'd learn essentially nothing about uh, reforming reactions, whether steam, CO2 or oxygen blown React uh, reactions in a bench scale unit because you can never reproduce uh, real Reynolds numbers and it means that the catalyst temperature would be far away from uh, what you will see in industry. So what we do instead, it's more expensive but more fun, uh, is that on one hand we scale up to pilot plants where we have industrial mass velocity and on the other hand we try to scale down to in situ uh, studies to study uh, the mechanism in a fundamental way. So again, to, to uh, take up the line uh, of the remarks by Mark Wright, we better, we better uh, extract our design kinetic from this unit. Uh, we understand the mechanism, maybe it will give us some idea to design a catalyst, but it is uh, a tool also to analyze the spin catalyst samples on the pilot plant so we know what we are doing. The key issue in the reforming reaction is of course whether you form uh, syngas or carbon. And uh, it's a question then how to promote uh, the, the catalyst that this reaction has failed. You could say you have a, a two, two ways of doing that. You could enhance the steam absorption on the catalyst or CO2 absorption, or you could try to inhibit the full dissociation of methane. Uh, in the early years, also those who have read my book, uh, this second uh, way of promoting the reforming catalyst was not mentioned, but I think there has been a lot of information over recent years uh, showing that this indeed may work. One way of understanding all this is to look into the mechanism of carbon formation. This is an old uh, overhead. You see here we have uh, 450 Armstrong and the nickel crystals. And from that we learned a lot. We learned that the thermodynamics is determined by the thermodynamic properties of this whisk of carbon uh, and not by graphite. But recently we have gotten into much more detail. Uh, uh, we have acquired a 300 kilowatt 
uh, electron microscope where we are able to do in situ studies. And uh, if it works, I will, we will try to show you uh, a short video. First here you see, here we have 50, 50 uh, Armstrong and we have a nickel crystal here and uh, a carbon fiber being formed. Let us go ahead and see if it uh, works. You see the, five, the nickel crystal moving and the carbon coming out and at one point the nickel crystal will look uh, at, uh, at the cameraman and it will go directly in and you better run away. That's like uh, when uh, you are game driving. <laughs> you also see how the nickel crystal makes uh, a, a change the shape very much. It, it becomes almost pear shaped. This, uh, this kind of uh, pictures uh, you uh, can see, you have seen before. Uh, the new thing is that we can run it uh, um, in situ and with a relatively high pressure and high temperature. Now, this was 50, 50 uh, uh, Armstrong. What we do in the next is that we go to a much larger magnification. So we take the next one. Here you see, just a minute, here we see the nickel crystal and here we see the carbon plates. You will see the, how the, the plates of graphite uh, are moving outwards. And then we come over here and see where the carbon comes from. If you see in this corner here, uh, in a moment you will see there is a dislocation. And all the carbon is streaming out here and arranging the, itself on the surface of the nickel. And also, if you look carefully, and you have time, you will see that the nickel plates parallel to graphite planes are nickel one on one. Uh, if you look 10 seconds through a keyhole, that may change your life. At least there are some books you will not read anymore. And the same here, you get some ideas of uh, what is really the mechanism of carbon nucleation. This is important not only for designing catalysts, it's also uh, important to understand how you can, yeah, for, important for how to, to understand uh, the promotion, how you could promote catalysts. It's also important to get a better understanding of the initiation of metal dusting corrosion, which is a key phenomenon when you handle high CO containing zinc gases. And finally, this is also the mechanism by which you make nanotubes for hydrogen storage. So in the story, uh, thank you. <coughs> Um, this uh, is just one example of uh, the information you can get uh, if you go very much into the fundamental details with your actual catalyst. Um, we have uh, worked very much with the, the old idea, which still works, that uh, it's, a, it's a spillover of steam to the nickel crystal which retards the, the carbon formation. Uh, but as I said, and you can you can understand that uh, you can understand that if you have uh, potassium on the support, you could have a stronger absorption of steam and spillover. Now we have uh, identified uh, that the potassium is really absorbed on the nickel crystal, and that it works as an steam enhancer and as well as. Uh, 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 promoter to retard the full dissociation of methane. But this would be to start another lecture. You, you can see similar things when you use uh, uh, lanthanum as promoter. But how could an oxide uh, 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 inhibit anything on a nickel crystal? But uh, again, in this in situ microscope, uh, here we have the spinel support, here we have the nickel particle, and you can see uh, at, uh, uh, in the presence of methane and hydrogen, you see that the lanthanum promoter is sitting stable on uh, the nickel crystal. So uh, you could dream about or think about that you have a decoration of the nickel particle with uh, lanthanum uh, and uh, that this uh, could impact uh, the selectivity uh, that you do not form carbon.
Here you see some thermogrammetric data showing the impact on Antinium and Syria. Uh, but we uh, wanted to go in a more systematic way and uh, we uh, looked on promoting uh, or decorating the surface with gold atoms. And you see here the nickel atoms uh, which have been quenched by the gold atoms and thereby you inhibit the full dissociation of methane as also predicted by uh, density function theory <laughs> calculations. Here you have the dissociation curve for, for uh, 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 so here the red one is for, for pure nickel and if you add uh, gold you will uh, get up. It means that you have a chance to stabilize CHX instead of getting uh, carbon on the surface. Also. Uh, this has an effect in uh, uh, when you measure carbon formation rates. We uh, practiced in industry another uh, surface alloying, namely using sulfur. If you have a complete coverage of sulfur, nothing happens. If you have very little sulfur, you get carbon formation. If you have, say, just a small side, not a full dissociation, uh, you can have the steam reforming going on or CO2 reforming going on. Uh, uh, without carbon formation. This has been uh, used for 10 years now in uh, one of the biggest reformers in the Houston area in the Sterling plant in Texas City. I will come back to a little bit about that. The way we scaled this up or work in parallel to our fundamental studies was at first in a power plant in Denmark. Uh, you can see uh, the way this person has his long backgrounds or whiskers, that is from the 60s. And uh, still we have blue skies in Denmark, not the CO2 and rain. And in this part we pioneered uh, uh, the, the steam after reform. Later we built a much more modern pilot plant in Houston. And here we have the monotube tubular reformer. And here, which I will show later, also an orthothermal reformer. This is a reform of a heat exchange reforming for fuel cells, and that is a two-ton uh, uh, methanol uh, plant, which was also used. Uh, we uh, used a lot of time not trying to extrapolate kinetics from lab experiments, but to extract data from the power plants and from industrial units. You see a young fellow in the early 70s measuring tube wall temperatures. And all that, and a lot of thermocouples in the pilot plants, so you were close to violating the principle of Heisenberg that you disturb the, the, the flow uh, through the catalyst bed by measuring uh, temperatures. Uh, we uh, developed a, a two-dimensional homogeneous model for, for carbon formation. And uh, here you see uh, the radial temperature profile and here you see uh, the, the, the methane temperature profile, uh, the actual methane the temperature profile across the, the tube radius, and this is uh, the, the critical ratio. So you will see that if the temperature is above these values, you'll get carbon formation, you'll get carbon formation close to the tube. All this you can build into a design program and uh, thereby uh, we were able to design uh, tubular reformers at much lower steam carbon ratios than before and also at much higher heat fluxes. In fact, in fact, you can uh, say that you have too much catalyst in a reformer. Uh, Lenny Smith talks about ultra uh, uh, high uh, uh, space velocities or ultra short uh, residence times. It's no problem at, say, uh, 600 degrees centigrade to have the same space velocities over a steam reforming catalyst. The problem is the heat transfer. So uh, as an illustration, I can only, I'm only allowed to show you the volume calculation, but I tell you uh, that, that, uh, that the measurements of the power plant, they are not far from that. Here you see the volume percent of methane in, uh, in the exit gas with six volume percent here in the dry gas and uh, eight and a half here. And here you see the effect of increasing the heat flux by a factor of six. And uh, the catalyst simply is able uh, to follow. Uh, so the catalyst is not the limiting factor. It's the heat flux and it is uh, the risk for carbon formation. And all that 
uh, we uh, steadily optimize it. Now, let us look on um, uh, how to make uh, syn gas for fissure troughs. Again, as Mark Rye said, we have uh, two different situations. Uh, what should be the hydrogen CO ratio, or what ratio should we use? For methanol synthesis, we have a ratio just like uh, you have for the high temperature fissure troughs. I think it's the same ratio if you make some aromatics. Uh, that uh, this ratio for methanol synthesis and high temperature fissure troughs should be close to two. And you see it depends very little on temperature and it is very little dependent on the steam to carbon ratio uh, uh, to the uh, orthothermal reform. For the low temperature fissure troughs, the ratio is very close to two. It's a hydrogen CO ratio. CO2 is not a reactant. In fact, it's a carbon loss uh, if uh, it is uh, leaving the plant. So uh, uh, you, um, you see that uh, the name of the game is to have a high temperature and the uh, exit temperature in your thermal reformer and a very low steam to carbon ratio. This has been the reason that our uh, development work over the, the last several years has been to decrease this steam carbon ratio without uh, running into the risk of uh, soot formation. And as I said, uh, we, uh, we have uh, uh, industrial operation of 0.6, which almost gives you the optimal ratio. If we look at the flow scheme for fissure troughs, again, we have seen that before. Uh, with the same gas unit being the most expensive part, it's evident that the first thing you should require from the synthesis is a very high carbon yield. In the methanol synthesis, for instance, you have a carbon yield far above 90%. So uh, all the carbon you have either to throw out or to burn downstream in a, in a power plant or what you would dream up, or you recycle back to the reformer unit makes the reformer unit bigger. Therefore, uh, you, you should have a very high uh, 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 carbon yield. It's, it's, it's evident that uh, uh, if, if this is made of gold, uh, you, should, uh, you should utilize this synthesis gas uh, as, uh, as good as uh, possible. So uh, uh, the, the product yields here, uh, the, uh, the, the one through product yield is important. All recycled streams uh, will make, so the reformer will make it uh, bigger if it has to go directly in. And of, of course, if you make hydrogen here to use as fuel, it's, uh, it's a very expensive fuel. It's using essentially oxygen to burn hydrogen into water. So, you can take CO2 back from the synthesis, you can take uh, the, the non-converted CO2, and in that way you can easily adjust the right ratio here, and also that you get the right uh, uh, hydrogen left for the product upgrade. Now, um, why not use uh, steam reforming then, since we are so good at making steam reforming? Uh, here I have a diagram illustrating uh, the, the carbon limits. But first let us look at it. Uh, this axis is all represent all uh, mixtures of steam and methane. And this axis is all mixtures of CO2 and methane. So at this point it means that you have a, uh, uh, you have a, a feed gas with a steam carbon ratio of 1.5 and a CO2 methane ratio of 0.5, and it means that you are here, uh, at that level you have another green line, uh, that would be in, uh, what hydrogen to CO ratio you have in the exit case. The blue line is the carbon limit uh, as calculated by this uh, whisker carbon thermodynamics. So uh, operating here should be more than, than, than safe. Uh, we, uh, in fact, we, we wanted to break this blue line, and this we have done 
by this uh, sulfur passivated uh, reforming. We can run out here. We can also, with a special noble metal catalyst, we can run out here where thermodynamics would predict carbon from this. So, why couldn't we just uh, take uh, a steam reformer running, say, a steam methane ratio of 1 and a CO2 methane ratio of, say, 0.7 and then make uh, the right hydrogen CO ratio? You see a lot of, 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 uh, of articles in literature talking about CO2 reforming and all the catalysts. It's simply because of the pressure. You have to operate the syngas unit at the, at the high pressure, the, at the optimized pressure for the fissure trap unit. And at, uh, at these conditions, uh, uh, you will not achieve a full conversion of the methane at these very low steam to carbon ratios and uh, also you form some CO2 because of the shift reaction and that will uh, uh, then also represent the carbon loss. So uh, in order to take down the methane, uh, the, steam meth no, the methane concentration in the exit gas, you need to go up in steam to carbon ratio and then the reform becomes too big. So, um, <coughs> It becomes all then uh, the economy of scale. The small plants, still uh, a tubular steam reformer would be the most uh, uh, favorable thing to use. Uh, and for the very last plants, an oxygen blown reformer. And that is because the economy of scale is different from a tubular reformer where you just add more and more tubes and with that uh, an oxygen plant. This. Uh, uh, break even point here uh, used to be around, say, in a, a in methanol equivalent, uh, 2,000 uh, ton per day. Uh, for this intermediate range, uh, you would build a hybrid plant with a tubular reformer followed by an oxygen blown reformer. That would be the most uh, economic solution. However, because of the developments in uh, the tubular reforming technology, this point is moving that way. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we have a methanol plant under construction based on steam reforming with CO2 import, which has a capacity of 3,000 uh, metric ton methanol per day. And I should be able to convert that into to barrels per day or fissure traps equivalent. But nevertheless, if we are to build uh, a fissure trucks plant in the world scale as we talk about today uh, it needs a capacity roughly three times what I just referred to. This can still be done in, uh, in, uh, also thermal, in one single or thermal reformer and uh, we are for sure in uh, far out where, where tubular steam reforming has no chance for economic reasons. We pioneered uh, the, well, we started optimized uh, the autothermal reforming uh, unit in, uh, in our pilot plant in, uh, in Houston. Uh, here you see the, the top of the reactor, and uh, it's fed with uh, 100 normal cubic meter per hour of natural gas. It's the smallest size you can use for such a unit uh, in order to get the hydrogen. Uh, uh, the fluid dynamics the right way. We supplemented that with uh, theoretical analysis, with uh, fluid dynamic analysis, and all these things uh, uh, led us to the optimization of the burner. And here you see the burner for this uh, 2,500 ton per day methanol plant, and a world scale physiotrop plant would be a plant uh, having four times as much gas. But all the, all the gas is coming through that small hill. We uh, have uh, revamped uh, the Sasso uh, Secunda uh, reformers, two of the thermal reforming, and here you see one reactor, and uh, it's processing uh, 35,000 normal cubic meter per hour of uh, natural gas, so that has been a big scale up from the 100 normal cubic meter per hour, uh, which we have uh, used in uh, our pilot plant. Now, uh, 
Why use uh, uh, the orthothermal reformer uh, with a flame? It isn't that complex? You have the high temperature and so on. Why not use uh, why not use uh, catalytic partial oxidation? If you were able to to carry out this reaction and only this reaction, it would be a dream reaction because the heater reaction is only nine k per mole. Uh, this is equivalent to what you have for the water gas shift reaction. So you could have a very uh, almost thermal neutral conversion of uh, uh, methane uh, into the, the right syntax. People have published that they can do this. Uh, again, they do not know exactly uh, what the temperature uh, is of the catalyst. There are examples that the catalyst has the temperature of the adiabatic temperature increase, so and not the low temperature. Uh, which is mentioned in literature. I'm not here talking about the work by Lanny Smith, which I think is a, a, a solid contribution. However, if you look at the also thermal reforming, as we have carried out in the pilot test, and you can notice we have been running the steam carbon ratios uh, around 0.2, uh, we get this gas composition. And if you convert it, and this is at the equilibrium at the exit temperature, which is 1057 degrees, almost, you can see the equilibrium temperatures. But here we have a methane conversion of close to 97%, and a selectivity to the dream reaction of close to 91%. So you are very close already uh, with the orthothermal reform. Um, then you could argue what is the most expensive part of the orthothermal reform in syngas plant is the uh, oxygen plant. It amounts to 40% of, uh, of the syngas uh, plant costs. So there have been many ideas of uh, using uh, air instead of, uh, of oxygen. And uh, here we run into to the following problem. Here you have uh, the oxygen flow uh, system, and the, the width of the arrows represents uh, the, the, the amount of gas running. And uh, you'll see that, uh, that the air blown schemes will end up with very big uh, uh, gas volumes, and you uh, end up with a, a huge amount of fuel uh, where you have very little fuel left here, which you could use in the reformer. Uh, no, 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 no. You could use it for, for, for some of the heaters here. But here you need to export uh, the, uh, a lot of fuel. Uh, we have made some calculations on the uh, impacts. Now let me just show you one thing. Oh, uh, on the impact of uh, of this uh, by using data from our orthothermal reform. First, let me show you uh, that this air compression is really big. We want to start in the orthothermal reform with air because if you want to make, uh, uh, say, uh, CO2 free energy, you would, you would uh, combust with air into a sink gas, uh, shift it into hydrogen and CO2 wash out the CO2, re-inject it into the natural gas, and then burn the mixture of, of a hydrogen and nitrogen in a gas turbine. Uh, at least the Norwegians believe they're also very rich, but that is the, uh, an honest way of, uh, of making, uh, of making uh, electricity. But just to illustrate that the, this air compressor is big, because this is the air compressor we have installed at our pilot site with that small reactor I showed you just before. It's a big big animal. Now we made this uh, analysis where we have compared uh, an air blown and an oxygen ATR scheme. The data I show here assumes nothing about the Fischer-Tropsch synthesis. But simply if we build such a, uh, uh, um, such a syngas plant, what are the consequences? You see that you need 11 percent more uh, feed plus fuel, and that the volume of syngas is almost twice as big to make the same amount of hydrogen plus CO. 
and that you have 60% uh, more steam export, you need a lot of power to compress uh, air instead of, uh, of uh, the oxygen, and it all ends up with uh, a uh, net energy consumption, because here we credit the, ex uh, the export steam. But even then, uh, the net energy consumption is 13% higher than in the oxygen grown steam form. That's one thing. Another thing which uh, is often overlooked when you talk about these air blown uh, schemes is that all group 8 metals, to our knowledge, will equilibrate the ammonia synthesis at the exit temperature. We have, uh, we have uh, of course, a higher hydrogen partial pressure in the, of the thermal reformer exit gas than uh, in the air blown. And the hydrogen goes with a power of three. But uh, we have very little nitrogen uh, as impurity in, uh, in, the, in the air. But uh, there's a lot of nitrogen in, in uh, the air blown uh, system. And it means that here we calculated for this case uh, 450 parts per million of ammonia in, uh, in the syngas compared to 59. Ammonia will have kind of impact on, uh, on the fissure trough synthesis, but for sure it will have an impact, severe impact, on the downstream hydrocracking or isomerization catalysts. So we uh, do not believe that uh, the air blown schemes represent a big uh, 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 alternative uh, to, to the fissure troughs. Other uh, attempts uh, deals with, uh, with uh, membrane reforming where you, uh, instead of having the big compression I showed before, uh, you just have a, a small compression of natural gas uh, to take care of a pressure drop through a feed effluent heater, and uh, then uh, you let the oxygen pass through a membrane into uh, the high pressure reactor, where the oxygen equilibrium pressure is 10 to the minus a very big number. And uh, for sure the materials the, the ceramic membrane materials you have available today uh, will allow you to, uh, to achieve uh, the right oxygen fluxes. Uh, and uh, um, so it, it's uh, in principle uh, doable. We have made a calculation where we have compared the two flow schemes. I forgot my overhead, but you can, you can subtract from the two balance, uh, uh, two sides of the balance. Uh, all the known equipment, and finally you end up uh, with uh, equipment which is different. You have the oxygen plants in, uh, in the ATR scheme, you have the big air compressor in, uh, in, uh, in uh, and heat feed effluent heater in uh, the ceramic membrane uh, scheme. And finally, having priced this because it's known equipment, you end up with uh, the cost uh, you have of the room you have uh, the unknown ceramic membrane reform. Uh, what? Yes, I'm, I'm fine. I, uh, uh, and uh, it tells us that there is room for improvement of uh, the sink gas uh, costs by doing this, but there's not room for revolution. Uh, for small scale units, uh, this, however, might be uh, a solution. I, doubts that uh, it would be uh, uh, worth taking the risk for the last scale. So uh, my conclusion is that uh, for a foreseeable uh, future, uh, the orthothermal reforming uh, is uh, a preferred choice for, for the syngas uh, for fissure troughs. It's doable, uh, it's ready, and it's running in uh, Seconda, which you will visit uh, in the middle of the week. So, thank you very much. We do have time for one or two questions. Still, still one, two, three. <coughs> no questions? Then let us thank Dr. Rostrup-Gilson once again. Thank you very much.